Hi everybody, welcome back to Moscone West. We're here at the RSA 2024 conference, theCUBE's continuous live coverage. I'm Dave Vellante, my co-host Shelly Kramer is with me. Rotem Iram is here, he's the founder and CEO of AtPay. Last year we introduced our community to AtPay, a security company that is also a cyber insurance firm. Rotem, you may remember we talked about having 50 different parts or manufacturers in your car, and the That's brake right. manufacturer takes no responsibility, <laughs> so you, you need a full-time mechanic. I don't know if you remember that conversation, but yes. it was uh, very right. enjoyable. Well, thank you for having me back. You're welcome, and it turns out, I, I said, wow, this is really interesting. How do we get involved? Turns out we're a customer, so. And we there did you go. that through <laughs> our, unbeknownst to me, through our agent. So, in this interview, we're going to talk about the emergence of the information security, uh, or insurance security category, uh, how it's sort of affecting small business, uh, got the potential to set a standard for product quality, consumption, across the entire security stack, and what's happening in that small to mid market. So, um, set it up, first of all, how's the show going for you guys? You know, what's happened, what's changed in the year? Yeah, well, oh, a lot has changed. This, uh, this show's always exciting, you get to see a lot of, of uh, new companies and new ideas, and uh, last year was a transformational year for us as well. Uh, really launching our InsureSec platform in a meaningful way. I think we have more than 5,000 active customers on the platform already consuming our, uh, our security kind of product um, and uh, we couldn't be more excited about what we're building. The reality is, you know, uh, AtBay is a cyber insurance and security company focusing on those smaller to mid-sized businesses. And what we see is that those companies are being left behind. Uh, just to give you one example, so we have more than 40,000 companies insured by, by us, less than 7% of them have an EDR, which means that 93% of them have a very old mm. antivirus technology, and that's kind of bad news. They're being left behind um, because for a number of reasons. First of all, nobody's even trying to sell them modern security because it is too expensive and it is too complicated to manage. Even if you gift them, better security, they wouldn't know how to operate it. And so they have this expertise gap and they have this lack of ability to pay, which means they're, they're left with, with old, old technology and that is not fixing itself. So we believe that there's a market failure when it comes to SMB security. Um, there is no consumption, no real consumption of modern security in that segment. What I think is so exciting about InsureSec is that by being their insurance company, we can see that, well first of all, let me say, you know, they're, they're all buying insurance already. Even though they're not buying security, more than four billion dollars of insurance is being sold to SMBs. They have claims that would have been avoided if they had better security. And so now, as the insurance company, we say, well, it makes sense for us to help bring down the cost of security because we would lose less money as an insurance company. And so by helping you adopt better controls uh, and not only subsidizing or reducing the cost of the security product itself, by actually managing your security on your behalf, the first person we're helping is ourselves because we would lose yeah. less money. And that combination allows us to unlock enterprise grade quality products and services at the price points that SMBs can, can actually afford. But it's not just that, we know who to work with. They are already our partners, they know us, they trust us. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a really incredible opportunity to be that kind of single point of, kind of the single platform for everything security in the mid-market. I, I love that perspective. Yeah, I, we too. were talking off camera about the Berkshire Hathaway uh, uh, meeting this weekend, the annual shareholders meeting. Ajit Jain was asked a question about cyber insurance. And look, those guys are incredibly successful, but you know, let's, let's face it, they're not cutting edge technology investors you know, they finally get into Apple, of course it's most of their holdings, their biggest holding now. They hate crypto, I, you know, we don't agree on everything, but it doesn't mean they're always right, but obviously they're right in a lot of things. Yes. His response, however, was interesting to me, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, it was basically every time we write in a, 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 a cyber insurance policy, we assume we're going to lose money. Um, and so he, he was sort of being negative about it. Your philosophy is really innovative in my opinion, because you say, all right, we're not, don't assume it. We're going to create a virtuous cycle where we'll help our customers lower their risk and essentially that will lower our risk. Is yes. that how you think about it? Yeah, I mean, as much as cyber is new and complicated to insurance people, uh, because it is a very technical domain, and it is a little bit unpredictable because there are new threats and attacks 
every day. At the end of the day, on the other side, there is a human attacker and they have an incentive, which is mostly to make money. Yeah. And that makes those attacks relatively predictable. We, I think in the security industry, we love to champion how complicated all of this is. Uh, I think so that people would pay us more <laughs> for our products. But if you look at actual attacks, most of them are very predictable. Uh, for five years in a row, 50% of all ransomware in America came from a single product. A vulnerability to a single product caused 50% of all ransomware in America. And so there are ways to, uh, understand how attackers are attacking at scale. And again, insurance is different from security, where in security you need to help protect the customer every single time. Insurance, we only need to get it right most of the time, yeah. right? Uh, part of the product is to pay sometimes. And so we believe that by studying how attackers attack, mimicking what they do, and then finding the opportunity, taking away their opportunities by helping our customers close those gaps, we can make them dramatically less likely to be attacked and we can make money and we've been posted, we, we've been making money on insurance for every year since we've been it, in business. Yeah, and to your great. point, it's impossible, at least today, in this day and age, maybe with AGI that'll change, but it's impossible to have zero risk. Yes. So that means you're going to have to pay out. So, so that, that also means then you have to figure out the balance of your portfolio so that you can ultimately make money being an insurer. Now you bring data, you've got a report that's coming, I don't know if it's been released yet, um, it says ransomware claims uh, have jumped dramatically, maybe you could share that with us. And th the smaller businesses, the small and mid-sized businesses are increasingly targets. We talked about yeah. this last year. Hey, I'm a small business, should I not worry? And you were like, no, you should worry. Explain. Yeah, yeah so you know, what, what I love about being, a, you know, I've started my career in security and I found myself an insurance guy. And what I love about insurance is uh, the, feel, the very strong feeling that this is the most important company you can build in security right now because because we are the ones who pay, and again and again, and we need to figure out why do we, why do we pay, where does damage come from, we get to collect a lot of data about what works and, and where do businesses fail. And what we've seen this year, and this is a report that's coming kind of next week, is that, first of all, looking at ransomware, last year ransomware went down quite considerably, or in 2022, it went down considerably. Uh, I think some people were, early to celebrate that uh, we finally got the better of the attackers. Uh, it's, it seems like that was a temporary uh, break, uh, potentially um, due to the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine that kind of caused some attack groups to uh, maybe lose, lose focus for, for a while. We're seeing more ransomware, dramatically more ransomware than we've seen in earlier years. In some ways, it's the same story, it's uh, predictable. Uh, attackers are going after remote access, perimeter uh, technology, exploiting vulnerabilities in those technologies in the same ways they've done before. What is new, and I think really interesting, um, is that uh, the attackers have, have slightly changed their tactics, but the ripple effects have been meaningful. And so historically, attackers have would encrypt your data and hold you ransom. Pay me so that I would uh, unencrypt your data so you can use your systems again. More and, more and more companies are getting better with their back backup solutions and they, they don't want to pay. So the attackers are now both encrypting your data and exfiltrating the data. Yeah. And so they create a double leverage for themselves. We encrypted your data, you need us to get it back, but we will also release it to everybody, uh, including all your customers' data, if you don't. And what ends up happening is that now, you might be safe and you may not have had a ransomware attack yourself, but if a partner of yours or a vendor of yours have had a ransomware and their data has been exposed, now you have a data privacy breach. So we're seeing what we call it a larger blast radius from each and every ransomware now impacting tons and tons of third party connected supply chain vendors in each and every attack. Just to give you a couple of examples from last year, we saw with the Move It uh, vulnerability, yeah. uh, we saw a, a huge spike in both education uh, organizations and in, in financial services that suddenly found that their data was online because a vendor of theirs uh, got attacked. And that is becoming a, a bigger part of the risk that the company needs to kind of take a look and understand uh, how to deal with. You know, and I think that one of the things about the SMB focus that is so impactful is that I think a lot of people, when they think about security, they think about, you know, only really big companies need this, but the reality of it is um, threat actors are 
you mentioned earlier, highly motivated by money. The yes. more quickly we can figure out how to leverage AI to, you know, to fuel our tax and that sort of thing, the more money we can potentially make. And small businesses, I mean, their breaches don't net as much revenue, but I think some of the stat, and stats are all over the board, but I think one of the things that I saw recently was like an average loss of a, a small business in an attack is about $50,000. I feel like that's probably on the lower end. Yes. But the reality of it is when you think about, you know, my yoga practice or my chiropractor's office or my kid's school, $50,000 yes. is a significant amount of money. So yes. I can, it's a huge market and it makes a lot of sense to target there. Well, first of all, we it's easy to forget about small businesses, but that's 70% of GDP right. in this country. So 70% of, of employees work for a small business. Right. And it's 90% of all businesses in the country. And so there's a lot of value there and a lot of damage. Yeah. It's a different profile uh, of an attack. The attacker is more opportunistic, it's more automated, it's more predictable in a way, yeah. but the damages are greater when in comparison to the size of the organization. So SMBs struggle to recover yeah. from an attack. They don't carry as much insurance. Uh, our numbers show it's 280,000 on average for a ransomware attack on a small okay. company. And 280K can very often uh, be the end of a, of a small business. Right, and, well, so, and I've also, many of them don't survive a yes. significant number of years after a breach. You just can't recover that. And from our perspective, the, the, the real issue is that there's, you talk to these businesses and uh, they are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed, they cannot deal with all of this themselves. We, we talked about this last year. Uh, it's just, it, we're asking them to do too much. Uh, they are buying IT, they're paying for it. That IT has holes in it. <laughs> nobody's helping them, nobody's notifying them. They need to now be able to identify, fix it, stay on top, deal with the attackers. It's, it's too much, uh, they lack the expertise. That's where we think that security companies are not stepping in, mostly because they can't make the, econo the economics work. They just can't afford the cost of acquisition. As the insurance company, we can come in and we can actually solve this. That to me is incredibly exciting because we're, we're not just competing, we're filling a gap that is really meaningful that I think is hitting the underbelly of, of you know, American businesses. It's a and that 280K, that's ransomware that you might pay, that's lost productivity. Yes. Business you know, continuity, business costs, all of that. Restoration of, of systems, yeah. uh, legal fees yeah. and fines and penalties and. Uh, real dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of money there. So how do you, so you, you're, the basic premise, if I understand it, is you're helping the business improve its security posture. Yep. Um, you'll also recommend actions, processes, tooling as, as So well. what we start is we actually provide you with our own MDR solution. Right. And so we come in, we have a partnership with CrowdStrike. We come in, we upgrade your, your security to the most modern, cutting edge, enterprise grade security. We manage it on your behalf. We have an, an MDR team that spans the globe 24-7, 365, so every time something, you know, some, something alerts on any one of your endpoints, it's our analysts who are remediating, responding to the, to the issue, and then we kind of alert and, and we bring in the, the client when, when needed, but we do the work for you because we understand this is technical, this is not something that you're set up to, to deal with yourself, so our SOC, takes care of, of the issues for the, for the customers. We can do it by give, providing them with this MDR, we can dramatically reduce the losses on the insurance policy, and that means that we can create savings for you that uh, basically at the end of the day makes this a very easy decision for you, because up until now, you were paying for insurance, you didn't feel like you could pay for, for an EDR, now you're getting the whole thing for basically the same price. It's a yeah. huge, huge benefit for yeah, the customer. that's very attractive. Very few small businesses probably none, maybe there's a handful, like highly technical businesses, but the very few small and mid-sized businesses are going to be able to have better security than what you could provide through your managed service. Is that a fair, fair premise? A absolutely, I think there's a, and again, sitting here in San Francisco, there's a bias when we, when you, you ask somebody here, what is an SMB, they say a startup. But yeah, right. Oh. Right. SMBs, what we call east of Reno, the <laughs> real SMBs are, are non-technical, Yes. Oftentimes, legacy organizations uh, with people, entrepreneurs who are passionate about what they do, but not necessarily passionate about cybersecurity. And I, I don't blame them. Uh, it's not something they should be spending their time on. Well, and the reality of it is, though, when you're competing for tech talent against the Googles and the AWSs and the IBMs yes. of the world, I mean, coming to work for my little, you know, 200-person SMB, 
Yep. I mean, how do I compete for that kind of talent? You really can't. It, it's very difficult, and I, I would also say, it's very, if you are on a limited budget, you know, the, the big, big, big enterprise clients, they buy one of everything. Yeah. Uh, but if you're on a limited budget, it really is difficult to understand what actually matters and how much should you pay. Uh, what I also love about the vintage of an insurance company is because we're the ones losing money, then we can say how much does each and every security control actually help drive down losses, which is why we show that certain technologies in your stack correlate or directly contribute to lower or higher losses and that, if anything, is to me the best way to figure out, okay, what should my stack look like? Um, and that's why if you take a big, big step back, you look at the role that insurance plays in every domain of risk, insurance is always the standard setter. It is yeah. always the regulator. Even you know, in this building, you know, there's, there are sprinkler systems here because of the insurance code, right. not because we're passionate about the brand of the sprinkler company, right? right? And, and to me, that, that's where I think security is, uh, especially in the small businesses is going to. So how much of a challenge is it educating your buyers about this? Because we've, most of us have been buying insurance for a significant part of our lives, yes. right? Our home, our cars, our whatever. Um, but it's pretty unusual to contract with an insurance company who also has this technology solution that protects me in a different way than my policy does. So how much of a challenge is sort of educating this package deal that you have? Yeah, so look, when we started the company seven years ago, uh, cyber insurance purchasing in the U.S. was under a billion dollars. It's 12 billion today. Mm -hmm. And so it's growing pretty quickly. And the expectation that we're only in the first kind of stage of, of this product really being, being picked up. Yeah. Uh, and so we've undergone this education journey. First, that cyber insurance is even a thing that you should be, you should be buying. I think that our bundling with security uh, makes sense to our customers uh, because they've, for, for the larger part, they've heard about these better technologies, they just can't really afford them. Right. Uh, they're all buying an old antivirus. They realize that this is an old technology. Uh, they don't necessarily want to be paying for it, but uh, when we come in, especially when we can kind of just lower the overall cost in a way that makes it very, uh, very easy for them to, to, to buy, they don't need a ton more. Yeah, it sounds um, like it's a fairly easy sell. Yes, it is. I mean, really. I mean we're converting uh, uh, at really good numbers, so. That's a wonderful well, problem to have. Yes. Well, I mean, insurance companies ultimately will figure this out because they're smart, they're well capitalized, uh, but they're slow, generally. Yes. Um, and if you go to an insurance company that is not tech savvy, that is not cyber savvy, what are they going to do? They're going to charge you a higher premium to protect their risk. So you come in and say, look, we're going to be more economically competitive because we can lower your risk, we can lower our risk, we'll pass some of that on, we'll make a nice profit, okay. Say at the same time, you, by combining managed services with insurance, I could get a, a, a double savings because you know, we've looked at managed services and they can tend to get very expensive, yes. right? And then so now I have a managed service stovepipe, I have an insurance stovepipe, so it just to me is natural that those two worlds are coming together. Yeah. My question is, where does AI fit? Because okay, so eventually my point is that your competitors, the big insurance companies will figure it out, but you're more technically savvy. Yes. How have you been using, how were you using AI prior to ChatGPT? How has it evolved? How does it give you competitive advantage? Yeah, so there's, uh, uh, we actually meet AI twice. We, we meet AI as an organization trying to leverage it to uh, get better, but we also see our, uh, the attackers using AI, and that is interesting as well. And unfortunately, with every new technology, attackers are always faster than defenders oh, to, yeah. uh, to adopt. Right. Um, I can spend two minutes on attackers, I'll talk about the defenders afterwards. Uh, the attackers are using AI in two ways. The most uh, benign way is to improve fraud. Uh, fraud is still the number one way of attacking companies. Uh, it's tricking you to send money to the wrong bank account. And uh, Gen AI has made fraud. We've all, we all know that, you know, the, almost by joke, the, the Nigerian prince type scams and how unreliable they are. Gen AI driven attacks are very reliable. Yeah. Uh, it's not only better text, it's now speech and video, and it's getting very, very scary. Uh, and remember, attackers go to where it's easiest. Yeah. And so we've now made it incredibly easy to defraud people. That is, that is about to explode. Later on, 
we see AI as a potential uh, hacker finding vulnerabilities. So having an AI help you find vulnerabilities in a new product, that's going to be very scary when that, yeah. that kind of you know, joins in as well. From our perspective, uh, so much of our work, and you hit the, the nail on the head, there's a lot of operations involved. We hold the hands of our insurance, both when it comes to the insurance side, but also with the managed security side. There's incredible efficiencies to be had by leveraging AIs to drive automation. And Gen AI is a, is a new kind of group of algorithms that is solving some use cases uh, around language, mostly. Uh, but we've been using automation in a, you know, AI for the sake of, of automation in, in a very meaningful way. Um, you know, the most important KPI in, in an MDR is your kind of analyst per endpoints. How many, how many endpoints can a single analyst monitor? Can you get beyond the 50,000 endpoints per analyst? And with AI, I think that, that that type of building a stack, an MDR stack today in 2024 is a lot more attractive than it was five years ago. Uh, we see us as having a big advantage by having built this now. So the defenders are closing the gap to the attackers, would you agree? Or no? I would say, I would say that the, the with AI, the gap is going to increase yeah. uh, before it closes back Initially again. Initially it increases, does it, does it ultimately decrease or no? Well, in the 20 years I've been in this, it, uh, it does not, not yet. Does, uh, it, does, it, does it slingshot or does it just stay? My, <laughs> I, I think that what we've seen historically is that attackers are, ca are uh, capped by the human operators because there always needs to be a human at the end. And so even if everybody's vulnerable, if you only have 20 hackers, you can only attack 20 companies at a time. And that has historically been the cap. With AI, can that, can that yeah, can break? Scale. Changes. Th that yeah. could scale. But I am also hopeful, I think that cloud does create this, this moment of change where environments that are in the cloud are much easier to protect. Uh, most SMBs, 90% of SMBs are still on-prem or hybrid on-prem and cloud. In the cloud, I think uh, defenders stand more of a chance. So the more that we can accelerate the move of customers from on-prem environments to cloud environments, I think the more chances we have. Rodem, awesome talking to you again. We got to go. Thanks so much for coming back in theCUBE and, uh, and best of luck. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Pleasure. All right, you're very welcome. Okay, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for Shelly Kramer and Dave Linthicum. We're live at RSAC 2024 in Moscone West. We're at Broadcast Alley. Come see us. We'll be right back right after this break.